Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, Dunn Street continues to partner with organisations across Australia and the globe to train leaders, develop engagement strategies and empower people to organise in their own communities. In 2020, Dunn Street will continue to work with folks that want to make a difference, inspire, give hope and build communities from the ground up. To find out how Dunn Street can partner with you, hit us up at dunnstreet.com.au. Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left political and cultural podcast that dives into the progressive issues of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. On this week's episode, we speak with Kate Thwaites, who is the new member for Jagger Jagger, the federal electorate in the northern suburbs of Melbourne, Victoria. We talked to Kate about her time growing up as a young person and what inspired her to become a journalist, her time as a journalist, and then we spent a bit of the podcast unpacking the challenges that the media industry are facing right now. And then we kind of reflect on some of the work that she's started to do as a MP since she was elected a little over 12 months ago and some of the challenges that coronavirus has um, presented to her, the work that she does for both her community and as a parliamentarian. So it was a really great interview. Great to have Kate on the podcast Uh, to talk about the work that she's doing. Don't forget uh, to subscribe to Socially Democratic via your favourite podcast app. Um, And if you're on Apple Podcasts, to leave us a review and give us a rating. And for all of your podcast updates, don't forget to follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So let's get to today's episode. taping this one on a Friday afternoon in downtown Melbourne and uh, on the line from the People's Republic of Jagger Jagger. We are joined by the federal member for Jagger Jagger, Kate Waits. Welcome to Socially Democratic. Thank you, Stephen. Good to be here. Uh, you're the final piece of a Troika interview series for Socially Democratic following on from previous interviews with your fellow class of 2019 federal Labor colleagues. I've had Josh Burns and Annika Wells on. And you're the final piece, and I feel like I've saved the best for last. No pressure. I won't tell them that you said that, but yeah, no pressure at all. <laughs> uh, I, I was having a quick skim through your Wikipedia page, and not that I'm really ever going to believe too much in Wikipedia, but evidently the reason why you're in politics is, is because of Josh Burns. I think Josh Burns wrote that Wikipedia <laughs> post, and I haven't been able to get it changed. Wikipedia is really strict about who's allowed to change information on it so um yeah that's a point of contention between the two of us somewhat i would imagine that when you're up in parliament he reminds you of that daily too knowing josh he's quite a humble guy that's right you know of course he he doesn't take the opportunity to rub that in at all (laughs) and by all means uh the norm seemed to have been established because i had josh on my very 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 first podcast a couple of weeks out from the 2019 federal election then after the election when annika uh, was elected in a quite a close contest. I had Annika come on, and I think she spent 20 minutes of the episode just ripping into Josh Burns. So I well, feel free I was, to do that today. I was thinking on that point, um, particularly given this is a podcast. Um, we've obviously been going through a really different period with Parliament recently. And the last time we went up to Parliament a couple of weeks ago, Josh and I decided to carpool to drive together rather than... Um, fly together. So I've had a quite intense period with Josh Burns recently. Um, And the way we actually got through that drive was the two of us um, listened to My Dad Wrote a Porno, the podcast. Don't know if you've listened to that, Stephen. But um, if you are ever stuck on a road trip with a colleague who is pretty good about talking about themselves, I would suggest putting on this (laughs) podcast because it's actually very amusing. Um, You'll laugh out loud and it means I can't talk quite as much about what's going on for them. That's smart. That's very smart. That's a good recommendation. Chris Bowen, uh, whenever he comes on the, the podcast, always has some good recommendations uh, for podcasts. So that's good to see that you've continued that norm as well. Um, check it out. My dad wrote a por- my dad wrote a porno. Is it a series? Yeah, or? so it's a, it's a, it is. It's a couple of years old now. So I'm late getting to it. Probably some of your other listeners are already all over this. But um, an English comedian, his dad literally wrote a porno, which you could download through Amazon. And it's him and a group of friends reading this terribly written porno (laughs) and commenting on it. And it is honestly laugh out loud, hilarious, hilarious. So highly recommend. Very good. As opposed to the very well-written pornos. 
yes, exactly. Uh, um, well, I don't know how to segue into the first question off the back of that conversation, but I will, I will, I will just cut and move into that first question because I can't Um, because it involves your childhood. Um, You said in your first speech that, uh, as a parliamentarian, that you were always an avid reader uh, as a child and have learned to interpret the world through stories, and perhaps this was inevitable that you became a journalist. I'm wondering if you can describe a story or a moment in your life that shaped your your values or your politics. I think there's a a few stories probably that um, shaped you know, who who I am and what my values are. When I was young, I think I was drawn to drama, really. Um, So I do remember reading at the age of 13, Anna Karenin, and just being so swept up in it and the idea of, you know, dying for love and how amazing that was. Um, But um, I think I also moved on from that sort of intense drama um, (laughs) to to stories that were probably um, more about how people interact in communities. And again, I can actually as a young girl, one of the great things about being an avid reader is um, there have always been a lot of books out there with really strong female characters so actually if you go way back and you know again I'm a a reader of um, the Brontes and Austin and those women are actually really strong and they're trying to work out their lives and their place in the community and I think that had a big impact on me in terms of the fact that um, thinking about who I was um, seeing how these heroines had worked through thinking about not just what was the drama going on about them once I got past that sort of um, connection to the drama, um, but, yeah, what were the values that they, um, I guess, maybe railed against in the world in the case of, say, a Jane Eyre um, or maybe even a, a lesser extent to sort of a uh, Elizabeth Bennet in Pride and Prejudice and, and all those sort of classics. Um, they're women who were thinking about what are the norms I'm expected to behave by um, how is that seen around me and what, how do I operate in that environment? And I actually think for me um, unpicking that a little bit was really significant because that it then meant I could do the similar things to how things operated around me, um, which meant then that I could look around and think, who's got the power in our society? Mm. Where do I sit in this? Um, where do other people sit and what's my part in, in maybe changing some of that? How old were you when you started to formulate those views and then start to do that at reflection and analysis about power dynamics? Yeah, I reckon I was probably, I don't think I was particularly young, I think it was probably mid-teens, um, that the sort of very individualistic sense that most of us have when we're young, right? I mean, I've got a two-year-old at the moment and um, the sort of intense self that she's got I think you actually hold on to that for quite a long time right it's a long time before you can think um beyond the boundaries of what actually affects you and how you're processing things but I think to me probably from the the mid-teens um I started to be able to do a bit of that reflection I'm not going to say I I think I'd unpicked it all but um uh, again I think what reading gave me was this real interest in the fact that um not everyone's experience is the same um, and that there are ways into understanding other people's experiences. Um, and that's probably where the storytelling came in for me as well, um, that I was really captured by that um, and sort of seeking out opportunities to do that, I think. So you went to university and studied journalism. Where did you make the link from your teenage years um, from your extensive reading um, and thinking about this sort of this pa- the power dynamics in your place in the world and then coming to that conclusion that this is a career pathway that you want to take. Um, w- was there a moment or moments that said, oh, okay, journalism is, it seems to be the natural course for me or, was, or did you ponder on a n- number of different opportunities? I had a terrible careers advisor at school. So, you know, it was either, you know, plumber, teacher. <laughs> So yeah. the options were never great for me, but I just wonder how you, because, you know, how did you formulate that that process? Yeah, so I, don't, I think it's quite, yeah, as profound as sort of a step-by-step process because similarly, I think, you know, the way you look at career paths when you're at high school is pretty linear. Um, and for me, I was 
you know, as well as being an avid reader, I was really good at humanities, right? So if you're good at humanities and you're a woman, I think the natural path that everyone tries to steer you towards is being a lawyer. Um, fortunately for me, my dad was a lawyer um, and, you know, love your dad, but um, I had the opportunity to see that actually being a lawyer wasn't like being on law and order mm -hmm. and you weren't in court fighting for justice every day and a lot of it was paperwork and some pretty detailed knowledge of some pretty detailed laws um, and actually while there's absolutely people contacting it a lot of it is being in your office doing that research or um, doing behind the scenes work and so I think I having had the opportunity to see that thought well law's not for me um, I am interested in what's going on around me I do like telling stories I am getting these good marks in English what do I do with it and that's where journalism came in what mattered to you most when you started uh, as a journalist? You started out, you, if you went, did you go straight from uni to working at the ABC? No, so um, I, I studied journalism at RMIT and obviously like all ambitious people, they're very keen to get a cadetship and um, got told by both the ABC and the age, oh, sorry, you just missed out. If we had one more place, you know, you'd be our person, which in a way was lovely to hear and in, the other, in another way I was like, well, what do I do with that? That's intensely yeah. frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who so do, I, who I was, do I need to kill then to uh, <laughs> that's right, exactly. prove, prove this theory yeah. right that you speak of? I will say that um, all the people who I think did get those um, cadetships have gone on to very successful Walkley award-winning careers. So the people probably made the right decisions um, when they were looking at who they brought in there. But, um, yeah, so I was thinking about, well, how do I get in? And um, I'd always been told by, by lecturers, you know, go regional, that's a place to, to make your mark sort of thing and, and get your first job. And I saw, and I can't remember where I saw it, but I saw a job advertised at a community um, radio station in Burke in New South Wales. So it was an Aboriginal community radio station. Um, and I applied for this job and actually been doing some community radio work through university. Um, and they awarded the job to me. And, and so I moved from inner city Melbourne. I was living in Carlton in a share house, um, studying at RMIT and moved to... Burke, as in back of Burke, yeah. far western New South Wales. So that was an incredibly eye-opening experience for me. Um, it, it was back in the ADSIC days, so the radio station was funded through ADSIC. It was um, you know, an Aboriginal station. It was a really big part of the town and the community and um, just seeing how that community worked um, was something, you know, that was really different. Um, and we had... It was a real challenge for me in terms of that storytelling piece because uh, I was running, I was employed to run an hour long current affairs show each day. Um, so I, I was the journalist um, and I was, um, you know, there to tell stories of Aboriginal people, um, which, you know, again, for me was really eye opening and, and probably quite a, really quite a privilege. Um, but after a while, also sat uncomfortably with me because. I did feel like it probably shouldn't be this young white girl who was taking on this role. And I also felt as someone just out of university that I didn't really have the skills yet to transfer them on to maybe an Aboriginal person who could take the, the role on. Um, so after sort of a, a trial period there, I did say to my boss, look, I, I don't think this is the right thing for me mm. um, and we left on really good terms and I, I do feel really grateful um, for the experience I had there and um, as an aside that radio station still operates in Burke Excellent. and um, I went back uh, it must be about 10 years ago now when I was working for Jenny Macklin when she was Indigenous Affairs Minister and got to visit and there were still some of the same people working there so that was that was pretty great to be able to hear that. That's pretty cool. So you started working for the ABC in the uh, as a news a, a news reporter yeah that's right um what mattered most to you as a storyteller how do you take the you know the passion that you had as a young woman um in storytelling and then translate that into the work of the cut and thrust of daily news mm. um i think one of the great things about working at the abc is you actually get a really broad grounding in news so um again on my you know trying to get in. Um, the first proper job I had with the ABC, they sent me to Warrnambool in South West Victoria and I worked there for two years running the newsroom there. 
Um, and so, you know, you cover everything from local council to the whale that's stuck in um, the lines off the coast. I had calls from Germany about that one. You know, if you ever want to make your career, um, make sure you've got a, a whale entangled um, in fishing lines. Yep. Um, to Jeff Clark, um, you know, his trial that actually eventually got him um, disqualified from being the chairman of ATSIC happened in the Warnable Magistrates Court. So you actually get this amazing broad sense of what's going on our, in our community. Um, some of it's a bit of a churn, like doing daily news and doing daily broadcast is not deep investigative reporting. It is trying to um, do that. Here's what's going on. Here's a snapshot of it. Um, you'll probably get a bit more in the next radio bulletin, yeah. um, which I actually found really interesting. I really enjoyed that sense of um, being able to talk with a whole range of people who you would not normally have access to or, um, you know, a reason to give them a call. What was the toughest assignment as a, a journalist across your career? Uh, that's a good question. I think... Um, you know, I was lucky I didn't have to do many of the sort of death knocks or anything like that, but... Um, What's a death knock? Oh, so a, a death knock is um, if a person has died um, and you're sent to knock on the door of the family and say, would you like to talk about person X? Mm. Perhaps you might use some um, ways of persuading them that are sort of like the world wants to know about person X and... Um, some of that stuff's pretty confronting. I remember, um, you know, reporting on, uh, again, because, it, you know, as a sort of radio reporter at the ABC, you really do cover a, a range of issues. And I remember reporting on a um, case in Melbourne. It was a long-running case, good tabloid fodder, um, quite sensational in terms of how the victim was treated and, I do remember waiting outside the hospital for the family to come out from visiting this victim one day and, you know, with the camera, family stopped to talk to me. Um, and it, it actually felt quite intrusive at, at that point. I, I was sort of thinking, you know, you shouldn't stop to speak to me, actually. You should keep walking on. Yeah. Um, but there's something about the power of the media um, that people do respond to and they do do talk to you. So that, that was hard in terms of those sort of situations are hard, I think, in terms of thinking about your personal ethics and what you come up against there. Um, I think you do remember, you know, there are certain sites that you remember, so getting to accident scenes early, that sort of thing, um, the sort of things that first responders deal with a lot. Um, you know, those images stick in my mind still. You recently wrote a uh, think piece for the University of Western Australia's Public Policy Institute about the current media landscape. Um, do you want to un sort of, for the listeners at home, just unpack that piece and then we can maybe dive into it a bit, uh, some of the topics that you raised? Yeah, so for me, that piece was really about, um, I guess, current media landscape, which has changed so much since the days I'm talking to you about when I was a journalist. So when I was a journalist, I reported for radio, then I reported for TV. Um, online was barely a thing um, and when I was reporting for TV I was reporting generally one story a day perhaps with an update for the midday news but you know news still had a bit of time to breathe news was mainly done by major outlets so there was almost a rhythm to the day so by the end of my career I was reporting on state politics here in Victoria um, it was pretty common that the shape of my day would be Government would have given a story to the Herald Sun and be on the front page, uh, be covered on 3AW and ABC Radio that morning. It would carry through until that night's TV news when I would cover it for um, ABC TV news at 7pm. Now, nowadays, there's no way that one story would cover that whole space. You would have had probably 10 to 15 different stories in that time just because of the pace and the churn. Um, and I think there's a few things around that. One is... Um, it means we have less of a common sense of stories that might be big and important in our community because now we can all filter our own news. Most of our news comes through our Facebook feed. It comes through a Google search. Um, it doesn't come from reading a whole paper. I don't, I don't read a whole paper anymore. And I think if I'm not reading a whole paper, there's probably no one doing that. And I think that changes the type of conversation we have, um, particularly 
for people like me and others in politics and other movements who want to be change makers, how do we talk to people who are outside the group of people who already agree with us? Because they're the people who are following us on Facebook. Um, they're the people who are tuning into our Twitter, um, who see the stories we might be in on, say, The Guardian, but that story doesn't anymore reach beyond that audience. So um, the bubble piece is sort of through the rise of social media and through um, the way news is now platformed, I think, um, you know, it was meant to lead to us having this real diversity of, of views, of moving away from an all-controlling contr mainstream media, but I actually think what it's done is, is uh, exacerbate some divides and mean that we can spend a lot of time talking just to people who agree with us. Um, it also makes it easier to spread misinformation and disinformation. So, again, if you have a group of trusted people who you get your information from, for example, Donald Trump, um, and you don't listen to anyone else, well, he can say anything through those channels and you in your self-enforcing bubble um, will continue to, to hear that. So that, that's sort of one side of it. The other side of it that I think um, is concerning, again, from a brought up how do we make change, um, is that I think in order to make change, people have to know what's going on around them and they have to have a trust, a level of trust in the institutions around them. And, you know, all the, all the data tells us and the um, surveys tell us that trust in government as an institution has been declining. Now that's changed a bit with COVID and we can talk a bit about that, yeah. but um, it was, you know, declining for a long time. Um, if people don't trust governments, they're not going to trust you to bring a big change about in their lives. And, that type of reporting I was talking about before, that local reporting where you're reporting on the local court, you're reporting on the local hospital, that's the sort of stuff that keeps those institutions accountable. Now, if, as we're seeing at the moment, um, a number of news, mainstream news organisations are shutting down, particularly regional um, newsrooms, we're going to have less and less of that sort of journalism. It's not that sexy but it's actually important for communities and for democracy and for accountability. And so I'm, I'm concerned that um, without a change in the way that our model of journalism is funded, we are going to lose um, a big part of what's helped keep our democracy ticking over and we're going to move into a system where really we have social media platforms where we shout in our own bubbles. How can government play a role in maintaining that uh, that diversity that you speak of that supports our democracy, whilst at the same time ensuring that there's a there, there's an independence for those news agencies as well? Yeah, so that independence part is a really big piece, and I think you know again, if we were having this conversation ten years ago when I was still a journalist. You know, I would have laughed at the idea of government being involved in funding journalism. I mean, public setting public broadcasting to, to one side. So the ABC, I think, obviously is funded publicly and has a charter and, and works to all of that. But, you know, I would have said to you, well, no, that's, that's obviously not the role of government. And I think certainly um, journalists who worked for private news organisations would have been horrified at the idea of government getting involved in funding them. Now, I think that has changed and it's changed because the model of funding journalism has broken. So the model relied on ad revenue, essentially, classifieds um, and other ads in, in print and on TV. Um, again, that money has been chewed up now by online. Um, so we're seeing um, private enterprise not being able to pay for journalism in the same way. Um, and I think there's a willingness to have government step into that space from, from the side of, journalists and news organisations um, with a look to how it remains independent. And there is actually a roadmap for how this could be done in Australia. So the ACCC did a really comprehensive review last year, last year or the year before, into digital platforms. Um, and they came up with some really sensible suggestions that, um, not surprisingly, this government has just done a terrible job of implementing. So... Um, 
two streams to it really. One is actually direct government support for that type of regional local journalism I was talking about. Again, I think, you know, we are seeing increased investment from philanthropists and that sort of side, but that tends to go into sexy, uh, long form uh, investigative journalism. It's not going into covering the, the local court, covering the local council. So um, there was uh, a recommendation around grants for essentially community journalism. Um, now, unfortunately, the way that scheme has been implemented by the government means it's been hard to access, not very successful. But there are ways you could do it where you could run it, say, through the Walkley Foundation to have it at arm's length from the government in terms of who might get those types of grants to support that ongoing community journalism. Uh, and the other part is regulating how online platforms work. So, again, a lot of the, and this is what media companies will argue, that a lot of the fact, the reason why they've lost revenue is because Google, Facebook, et cetera, don't pay for their content. I want to ask you questions about online media in a moment, but before we do, I found it interesting that in your article, you when you were talking about social media creating that political echo chamber, you said, I'll just pull a quote here from for you. Uh, by the way, I will put the link up to this article on the podcast. So for folks who are listening to this and they w- want to go back and have a read of what uh, Kate wrote, it will be available uh, in the bio for this week's episode. Um, you said when so much information is available, it becomes more difficult to know which information to trust with the perverse consequence that while we trust nothing official, we are more open to disinformation campaigns run by those agen- with the genders to shape uh, what we think matters and how we vote. That sounds counterintuitive, right? But uh, explain, explain how you've come to that. Yeah, so it, it does indeed sound counterintuitive. Like you, you would think naturally that actually what would happen in a world with so much information that we can't filter, we would actually um, go back to first principles and think, right, where something that has been editorially checked, I know I will trust that. In fact, that's not, uh, study after study has shown that's not how most of us operate. Um, and again, I think um, current environment under COVID is actually a really good example of, of how that um, works where, um, and again, it's not all bad. We have seen a, a, a rise in people seeking out mainstream media sources, looking for information on what's going on. But we've also seen a rise in people sharing um, videos about how Bill Gates and 5G caused the virus. Um, so what happens when there's that much information out there is that once we click on that official source, well, someone else on the internet can tell me why that official source may not be entirely correct. And so then it plants a seed of doubt in my mind where I think, well, okay, well, if it's not entirely correct, it's probably not all correct. So I, uh, at that point, don't look for official sources of information. I look for sources of information that confirm what I already think, that sort of confirmation bias idea. Mm. Um, and often I will look for people who look and think like me as well. So I'll take that opinion from friends and family because I feel more confident in what they say and trusting what they say than, than the official source. And that is a real challenge, I think, um, in terms of how, how we even find the language to talk to people who, who aren't reading the same sources of information that we're having and, and having the same conversations that we're having because if we can't find those points of connection, it is really hard to convince people that things need to change. Yes, and that's that. That picks up the second point I want to make. I don't know if you knew this or or read this or saw when um, the opposition leader uh, Anthony Albanese uh, addressed the Chifley conference last year. Um, he had a bit of a whack at Facebook in his remarks. Uh, I don't know whether he's continued to to do that, but it certainly was significant. I remember standing in the room and going, "Oh, okay, this is uh, this is interesting." Um, well, the first thought in my mind was, geez, Albert, do, can you get a, can you actually get a win on this one taking on such a big organization? I think it's a good fight to have. Like I, you know, I can completely understand where he's coming from. Um, but my, the, the worry I have is that the social media landscape is moving so rapidly and so quickly that for legislative or regulatory um, uh, changes to be brought in, you know, the way that politics works, 
for a good reason that, you know, it's time to be, you have to be considered and, you know, work bipartisanship and work with people across the aisle and all that kind of stuff. That takes time. <laughs> Whilst we're doing that, you know, uh, Instagram goes from being the number one fastest growing platform to all of a sudden TikTok pops up to, you know, and, and what I'm getting a sense from now is that all the kids on TikTok are all jumping off that because all of their parents are on that now, you know, and they'll go and invent something else. And they're just, we're just constantly, I mean, I know that Facebook certainly has been a constant throughout all this and, re- and Twitter as as well. Um, so there's those mainstays, but I just think I just, it seems like such a tall mountain to climb from a government perspective or from a public policy perspective. What, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? It's not a question, it's more of a kind of thought really. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, and it's, I think it's a really valid thought and look, um, my observation would, I, would be, I think that in, in general, our parliament is not that great at dealing with issues of technology and someone like Tim Watts could tell you much more about that that, than I can and and I do agree that some of that is um, that these processes do take time in a legislative sense and that it is a constantly moving um, landscape and also that you know a lot of us politicians don't tend to come from a background where tech has been a heavy part of our life so again we're not using it maybe in the same way that other people or understanding it in the same way that someone who who has expertise um, in that area are. At the same time, I think um, while they're fast moving, these companies have changed from being little startups, um, you know, who, who were the disruptors to being the big corporations, um, you know, and again, if you sort of think about it from a, guess, social justice um, campaigning type of model, you know, the, the companies that we sort of used to maybe rail against, the, the big mining giants and the multinational corporations, these social media companies are those corporations now. So I don't think we can vacate the, the space entirely. I think there is, you know, if, if you believe that part of the role of government is to make the world a fairer and more equitable um, and just place for everyone, I think there is a role for government um, in thinking about how you regulate these these companies. Um, and I think there's also, and, and I talk about this in the essay as well, I think there's also a community education piece, um, which again, governments have varying success with running public education campaigns. But, you know, we do, we do need to work out how to get people to think about what they're consuming online, um, to question the facts behind what they're reading and to find those those ways of talking um, particularly to younger people I think who are just used to getting all their information in this way so that they do have other ways other methods of, of thinking about what's going on. I want to put my old Labor Party uh, uh, party official cap on for one moment um, because you know, we're talking about uh, journalism and the fourth estate in a way that's so important and integral to our democracy. Um, however, when I'm in the trenches, my God, journalists give me the shits, you know, and I'm not even a press sec. I've never been a press sec. Don't ever let me, like, we had a rule in field, which was don't talk to journalists. <laughs> you know, that was that was our attitude towards the media. Um, notwithstanding, some wonderful journalists out there that I love dearly, um, and hello to those that may be listening, but... Um, you sort of touched on a point before about sort of these bubbles that have been created in which we're reading the media that we want to read uh, in the online space. And I, I, I watch the way in which our major news institutions start to behave and the, the editorials and, and, and the journalists, you know, the age isn't. And I, you know, a lot of our branch members who are so goddamn passionate, I remember I was a young man when you used to get those stickers during the Koenig years, which was don't buy the Herald Sun, you know, it's just a Tory rag, right? So you'd be all fired up about that. Um, as you get a bit older, you start to realise that that's not entirely the case, right? But there are moments there where I feel like the age, even though it's not the mouthpiece for the Greens Party and the Herald Sun or the Australian is not the media division of the Liberal Party, geez, sometimes it's really hard not to think otherwise, right? And it's interesting to note that I've just said I have not given an example of where there is a bias for the Labor Party in the mainstream media, which probably proves to me that we're in the centre and that we're right. But notwithstanding that, um, should we just get to the point now where where journalists, because like like in the, in the United States, MSNBC is quite clearly just a mouthpiece for progressives in the Democratic Party, and Fox News quite clearly is just a mouthpiece for the Republicans. And it's without them 
st- stating that, it's just kind of like everyone knows that. Do we get to a stage with our journalists where they just go, look, you're high, you know, I'm Clay Lucas and I really like the Greens and here's my story for today. You know, like, let's stop pretending. Or do we need to hold journalists to account and editors to account and say, hey, can you start right reporting the news and not inserting yourself or your opinions into the news? I would argue the latter and I would argue that in the Australian case because I don't think we have the market to support, um, you know, the, the reason I think that model kind of works in the States is they can have 20 different outlets that actually have a fairly decent reach and are well-resourced um, and do, um, you know, pretty obviously, as you say, um, you know where they align. And the UK is probably a bit the same. You know, they have, I can't remember how many daily papers it is. A lot. Um, exactly. And, and, you know, they they do traditionally line up. So in Australia, we, we've tended not to have that model. We do have this sort of... Um, or of impartiality that, you know, our papers, while I think we all, as you say, have a sense of where they line up, they tend to um, try and show that that's not always the case. Um, You know, I think some of the things we've been discussing have meant that news organisations are probably moving away from that model a bit in Australia. So the success of The Guardian in Australia, I think, um, probably demonstrates that there's money to be made in being a bit more um, obvious about where your, your colours lie. Likewise, um, and it's also financial success, but, you know, it gets talked about the, the sky commentary, um, mm. you know, is playing to a model that is, you know, very clearly not pretending to say we're taking a middle-of-the-road approach here. Um, you know, they're really taking a partisan model. So, you know, I think there is... And I think that's people trying to seek out audience and trying to seek out money in an environment where debate is fractured and and the way we talk is fractured. Um, So, uh, you know, my argument would be that I think we do still need centrist reporting, Um, you know, that, yeah, we won't always agree with it and probably, you know, we'll feel hard done by um, (laughs) from a a good chunk Mm. of it. Um, And, of course, it, it... you know, it could be better. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of great journalists out there and I think a lot of them would, would think it, it could be better as well. Um, and, and that's where I think, again, the upheaval and, and the, the shifts the media industry are going through. Um, we're going to have to keep looking at that and thinking about how do we still come out of this with some kind of shared conversation rather than, 20 uh, different niche conversations on either ends of the, the spectrum. Yeah. And the follow-up to that is in my thought process was how influential is the media today in our shaping our politics? You know, for decades, the rule of thumb was that the media in this country could take down governments. And we've got plenty of examples that we could point to. And we always hear the stories of, you know, opposition leaders leading up to elections, having to go and visit Rupert Murdoch and kiss his ass to get a good editorial before an election, right? But certainly from my own lived experience as a campaigner um, and analysing a lot of the private polling that we've conducted over the years, experiments that we've run in terms of testing message delivery, um, I feel like the media uh, doesn't have as much influence on outcomes and uh, shaping voters' views as they walk into the box to vote. Um, I don't think that's a common view shared by fellow Labor campaigners across the country. Maybe it's a very Victorian-centric thing, but, you know, like I think about... In the last, like during the, the, the lifetime of the last Andrews government here in Victoria, the Herald Sun, 3AW, Neil Mitchell, you name it, they just spent four years throwing everything at Labor and the Andrews government. And then on the last Saturday in November in 2018, Labor was returned with an 11 seat majority, you know, a 5% swing on our primary, 57.3% on two party preferred vote. It was a landslide after they did everything in their powers. Like it was so blatantly biased the way that they were just, you know, trying to um, shift the, the the conversation. And even to think about, it would be unheard of in a previous government for a premier to not go on Neil Mitchell. I don't know if Daniel Andrews has been on Neil Mitchell. I had to go back and try and find, I don't think Daniel Andrews has been on Neil Mitchell since he's been premier. Um, that's unheard of. Is the media really waning in its influence is, I guess is the question I'm posing here. Yeah, uh, well, certainly um, audience numbers 
are down. Um, until COVID again. So um, one of the interesting things about what's happening at the moment, and I, I mentioned before that, um, you know, the most recent surveys have actually shown um, an increase in trust in government. Um, the most recent rating surveys have shown an increase in um, readership and audiences for mainstream media outlets. So I think there is something um, to unpick there about what people in a time of crisis um, turn to and actually some of those institutions that um, they may have been willing to cast aside at, at earlier times become more important um, at that time. Um, certainly, look, I, I agree with you that the influence, that just that new cycle that I described earlier, the sort of the one that played out through the day where you sort of knew you're going to get slammed all day or, you know, this story was going to run for three days and then it would move on. That's really changed. Um, stories don't have the same cut through in the way that they did. Having said that, though, you know, the nightly TV news bulletins still, in terms of a single source of people watching one thing, are the, are the biggest thing we've still got. So, um not as influential, but still influential, I think. Yeah. Um, let's turn to your uh, your role now, not being behind the camera, but being in front of it. Uh, how have you found that transition actually to go from being someone who's asking the questions to now having to answer the questions? Yeah. Um, so I actually left journalism a while ago, 10 years or so ago. And I, I um, left journalism because while I really loved it, I think it's a really important thing. All the things I've been talking about, accountability, scrutiny, all that sort of thing. I got to the point where I thought, what I do most days is I talk about what other people are doing. And that's really important. But what would it be like to be one of the people who's doing the doing and, and trying to make the change? So um, I left and was a media advisor at Oxfam and then for Jenny Macklin and then I was a public servant and now I'm an MP. Um, so, um, so, so the journey from journalism to MP hasn't been an immediate one for me. There's been a, a few steps um, along the way. But I think, you know, one, one of the big changes really in trying to do the role from being a journalist is um, you have to work with nuance a lot more. Um, so, you know, again, part of the role of a journalist is to interpret the world um, you cut out a lot of the, the grey, you make it pretty black and white and, um, you know, maybe this is something we struggle with a bit more on the Labor side of politics than the other side do, but there's grey in things and, and trying to think about how to talk about that and how to convey that is, is something um, that's quite different. Um, and, um, you know, I think the other part that's, that's really different is thinking through, as I said, that change from being someone who really your role is to make sure you're looking at what's going on and applying the right type of um, exposure to it um to someone who's thinking about well what's the outcome we want to get um who do i need to work with for that outcome um journalism can be a pretty solitary job to if you're if you're a journalist you you kind of write your story you you'll, you know if you're in broadcast you'll have a camera person who helps you and an editor and that sort of thing but actually pretty much about you mm. um you know that's pretty different to being an mp and being a member of a party and an opposition um where you're thinking about right well who do i need to talk to what are the alliances we need to build where are the common themes you know how are we working together to bring about to bring about change so, so that's definitely different what surprised you about the role so far since you've i mean when was the election it was Mid last year, so we're over it. Yeah, it's just over a year ago. We just had our year anniversary. I reckon the thing that surprised me the most is it's essentially two jobs in one. And maybe I should have thought about this, but I, I don't think I thought about it enough. Um, so the the job in the electorate is very community oriented, and in a weird way, even though I was saying people don't trust government anymore and they don't like politicians, as your local politician, most people really like you and they love you coming to their sporting event and um you know when they talk to you they might not agree with your policy or a decision that's been made but they're really quite respectful in in how they have that conversation with you and um you know when I was um during the election campaign when I was introducing myself to people I had a lot of people say to me 
look, um, you know, you seem lovely. Why would you want to do this job? Um, and that's because of, I think, the second part of the job, which is when we get a camera and everyone sees us on the TV in question time. And it, it really does feel like a very different role and that almost the persona you have in that role is very different. It's not community. It's not talking to people about their lives. It's actually quite aggressive. Um, it's thinking about what are the points of attack um, or being defensive about points of attack. Um, it's, you know, very fast paced. It's about getting profiles. So it's about, you know, where do I shout so that someone notices that I'm, I'm shouting. Um, and so two almost quite distinct jobs there with distinct personalities and skill sets. Uh, Annika Wells, I think when she was on the podcast, talked about it, the, about the, the theatrics of the chamber and said it was very sort of, I, I, I don't want to misquote her, but she was basically saying it was quite an unnatural environment and people behave in a very odd, kind of very aggressive, adversarial, male testosterone type of behavior that you wouldn't do normally in any other kind of environment, um, which I find to be spot on. And it does, you're right, it shapes the way people perceive politicians because that's kind of like, that's your, um, that's your theater of play. You know, no one knows what uh, a professional basketballer is like privately, but we know what they're like on the court, right? Because that's when we see them fight three times a week or whatever. Um, same for you guys. When we see you, it's when you're in Canberra and you're all yelling at each other. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how you change that, but um, I think Annika started to talk about that. Maybe we need to get some of the some of the, the women together and say, hey, look, this is, can we do this differently? Yeah, I think those are conversations that we, we are trying to have um, – I think particularly, you know, well, I, I, I think probably female parliamentarians have been trying to have these conversations for a long time, but I know for me with the class of 2019, there's a great group of strong women who I think are interested in um, how do we do things differently? Why is it that, you know, when you're sitting in the chamber waiting to make actually probably quite an innoc innocuous speech that this bloke you know, on the other side who you've never had a conversation with. You know, I've had guys on the other side who, to be honest, I think if I walk past them in the corridor, they probably wouldn't realise I was a parliamentarian because they're not great at seeing females. But um, yeah. they they will say things like, you're new here. You know, you don't, you just don't understand how this place works. And, you know, that's their starting point. Yeah. That's the sort of heckle that they go with. And you think, really, you know, are we, that's it. Are we in primary school or like <laughs> what's going on here? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, and then I think obviously that does reflect in how people see um, politics and, and, and the business that we do, right? They don't see the fact that actually a lot of what we do is, is talking to ordinary people, trying to work out what's going on, trying to do some thoughtful work around how do we change things because the bit they see is, is us all yelling at each other. So it is pretty entrenched and I think entrenched behaviours do take a long time to change and there's always that danger that you know maybe you get swept up in the entrenched behaviors yourself yeah. um but i think there's certainly um interest um and and unofficial conversations between um those of us who are new about what do we do differently and how does it operate differently do you get a sense that that conversation is happening on the other side of the chamber as well internally i don't know i can't speak about that with any authority really look they they have far fewer women than we do that's you know i think again it's one of the great labor success stories right that mm. we have actively endorsed and elected women um because of josh you know, again, when I, <laughs> except for josh burns exactly um, <laughs> when i you know and look josh is going to hate this but i told him this personally when i walk around parliament with josh burns right i'm going to give him a slight compliment here He's tall, he's yeah. good looking, he looks like what people expect a politician to look like. And so people let him through the door and then they say to me, excuse me, have you got your pass? Oh, God. Uh, oh no, 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 I, I'm an MP too. Uh, you know, and again, there's sort of the opposition MPs who are less used to having um, women as part of their, their team. Again, they'll say hi to Josh and look straight through me. Mm -hmm. So there is absolutely, um, you know, still this sense about... Um, what does a politician look like, um, you know, and it's it's a bloke. Um, so that that's definitely something that I think our side 
are doing more to change. So whether on the other side there are similar conversations, I would hope so. Um, I think the independents feel it, obviously. There's, you know, there's um, what, four independents at the moment and three of them are women. Um, and, you know, I think that's something that, that they feel, um, certainly in, in that space as well. Um, how have you uh, managed to do your job as a public official in a corona environment where we can't really be out in the public? Um, how have you made adjustments to overcome these challenges? I'm finding this quite interesting. Just even looking on social media, seeing different politicians try different things. It must be tough. Yeah, it really has been. And again, um, as a new politician, you know, I think some of that stuff I was talking about, about like working out who are you in each space, I felt like I was just starting to get my head around the parliament space and then wham, bam, no more parliament, thank you. We all need to, you know, stay home and stay safe, which is absolutely, of course, what we need to do. But um, it did mean that the sort of almost rhythm that you were starting to get yourself into um, got disrupted. And for me, it was a, a real moment of, well, what's, what is my role? You know, I'm an opposition MP, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not shaping government policy. I'm not, I'm not at the front line of um, putting the emergency response in. And again, um, my job before I was elected was um, I was um, doing communications at DHHS, the Department of Health and Human Services in Victoria. So, you know, I also had this feeling of like, oh, I, if I was working still, I would... Um, I would be very busy planning public health um, communications campaign at the moment. So um, thinking about, you know, in an environment where you're not directly shaping policy or response, what, what was my role going to be? And um, part of it became pretty clear quickly just from the sheer need of constituents. So um, people very much, I think people who had never probably called their local MP's office before were calling my office because they were dealing with Centrelink for the first time and realising that dealing with Centrelink is not a good experience or they were trying to work out, you know, the convoluted rules around JobKeeper and needed someone. Um, they were Australians who were stuck overseas um, and who didn't know how to come home. Um, there was a, a big upturn in sort of that community work that I was talking about earlier and that kept us really busy um, during the first phase of um, the pandemic and I think um, you know for me I tried to also do personal outreach so um, you know we set up calls to people who might be more vulnerable to our organisations who were supporting more vulnerable people checking in on that community level there um, and how like you, I said I think you, that's how did you find that well this is another real difference um, I think that's happened in this crisis that um, you know, as you say, you've been a campaigner, um, so you've probably done a lot of phone banking in your time, um, and <laughs> you would know that the reception is generally not that excited when you say, hey, I'm blah, blah, I'm the candidate for wherever. Um, people were thrilled, actually, like really appreciated getting the call from me or from my office. Um, I started sending out email blasts to everyone who ever emailed me. Um, which, again, you know, with the history and comms, I expected that the response I would get from an unsolicited email from a politician would be, how did you get my email address? I don't want to hear from you. Um, it was not. It was people were really hungry for information. And so, you know, it wasn't so much political information that we were putting out. It was information about what was going on. Um, but that sort of community role around here's where the official information is, here's how I can help you interpret it, um, was actually really important, particularly in those, those early stages. I think that's died down a little bit now. And I think one of the things that, um, you know, me and colleagues I think are grappling with a bit is um, how do you do outreach going on from there so that the normal opportunities we have to talk to people who, who don't call our office, so going to a school fate, going to the sporting event on the weekend, you know, those are the times when I tend to find I reach people who probably aren't that political but want to have a chat to you about an issue that's important to them. Um, so I've been really trying to think about how do we talk to those people, um, trying to use social media a bit, I think probably not with huge success, but um, thinking about how do you show your community that you're 
be here for them in a time of crisis and, and a resource they can use, I think, has been a big part of it. But it has been really different to that sort of um, going to Canberra and standing up with your, um, I guess, your platform in the chamber and, yeah. and shouting on behalf of the community. Did you notice that um, people who, I mean, it's really interesting you talk about that. You mentioned people who normally would not engage with a politician or be active in that way show interest or passion around issues that were important to them. Have you noticed that there are people who are taking on leadership roles um, and not in a very formal, I'm the head of the Country Women's Association sort of leadership roles, but leadership as in there's a problem within my community it could be, and that community could be defined in any way. And I'm going to do things to help others um, and engage with you as as a leader as well. Have you noticed that that started to happen? Like I, so many examples of people who have sent out notes to their neighbours saying, "Hey, if you need anything, just let me know. Here's my number. Here's my contact details. Here's a bunch of other people." There. Have you noticed that sort of leadership at that real community level start to develop? Yeah, I think. Um there has been a real desire from people to to want to be able to help. So, again, interestingly, um, so people would come back to sort of an email and say, thanks so much for the information. Also, just letting you know, if you want someone to support vulnerable people in this area, this is where I live. Um, You know, the other thing I've observed around that, again, in those initial days, we were getting a lot of calls from people um, concerned about the restrictions not so much from a these are terrible and I can't live my life point of view, more from a um, I don't want to do the wrong thing but I don't really understand the restrictions point of view. So I found that really interesting as well, that there wasn't this sense of, you know, um, civil unrest or people um, feeling oppressed. Um, There was a sense that I want to be doing the right thing by the community. Can you help me work out what that is? Yeah. Well, I mean, Scott Morrison did such a great job at those early press conferences explaining these restrictions. So, I mean, I, I just don't know where this confusion could come from. Exactly. It was crystal clear, wasn't it? Go to the footy, don't go to the footy, shake hands, don't shake hands. So, um, yeah, you can see how people, um, yeah, got confused. Uh, last couple of questions before we wrap up in terms of some of the things that you want to uh, achieve or the things that you're passionate about in your role as a as a member of parliament what are the what are some of those issues that you want to start to I mean obviously we've talked a lot about um, the, the role of media and journalism but is there any other issues that are sort of jumping out at you that you want to I know you mentioned some stuff about around childcare um, in your maiden speech yeah, so one of the things I talked about in my maiden speech, which is very related to my experience, but I don't think I'm alone in this, is, um, you know, being a woman of a certain age and having a child and working out what that means in the workplace. Um, so, um, you know, I think we live in a society where until we've all been working at home in the last few months, our workplaces have really been built around a model of presenteeism. So, in order to be at work, you are at your desk nine to five. It kind of doesn't really matter if you needed to be at that desk, which that's, this time has probably shown us to a degree you didn't need to be at that desk. Um, but in order to be seen as a productive member of that team, that's what you do. And that model, I think, is really based on an outdated notion that there's someone else at home taking care of all the other shit that's going on. So the cooking, the cleaning, the small child who got sick and couldn't go to childcare or just couldn't stay there until 7 p.m., um, but that person's not there anymore. You know, we do work in, in two, um, in, you know, the majority of Australian households have two working parents. Um, it's just that the fact that there's this kind of uh, pretense that someone's at home tends to mean that women work part-time or take steps back in their career um, in order to, um, I guess, facilitate that really. So, you know, I think there's room for a cultural change there in our workplaces and, and how we allow men to see their roles. So um, one of the things that we were able to do in my family was that um, when I had my daughter, I took the first nine, ten months of leave and my partner took the next three months um, of leave full time and then he actually went back to work part time while I went back full time because I was running for parliament. Um, so um you know, that totally changed the way he interacts with our daughter, you know, and, and he would, and I would say he was a good father before that, but he just didn't understand. He didn't know 
what packing the bag for a, a day out looked like. And in fact, I have a story that I've told in the parliament, so I'll tell it again and shame him again. But um, you know, quite early on in this in this swap, um, he decided to take my daughter, who was um, about 11 months then, to go visit his parents in Newcastle. So he's going on a plane trip with her. Um, we had flown with her before. We'd been on a, a holiday before, so. I think at that time he'd kind of just been like, that's not that hard. And I was like, hmm, is it not that hard? Or was I doing most of the work? But, um, you know, before he went on the plane trip, I, I said to him, um, you know, are you ready to go? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. And I thought, should I check the bag? Should I look at what is packed? And I decided, no, no, I'm not going to look at the bag. Um, so he went off on the plane trip. I went to my work Christmas party. Um, and during my work Christmas party, I was getting phone calls because uh they were on the plane uh the plane got delayed taking off so I think before they even took off he'd run out of the two nappies he'd packed um halfway through he'd run out of the I think you know one dose of formula he'd packed um he ended up sitting on the plane I think with we on his lap and our daughter <laughs> screaming at him um, because she was out of food and wet. The plane was going through turbulence. Uh, um, you know, I do feel sorry for him. He said he felt like the um, the flight attendants were dad shaming him a bit, like, how could you be so hopeless? Yep. Um, but, you know, it was such a learning experience for him, to be honest, because he doesn't go out without packing all the things now. Um, and I do think there's a part where you just, you have to be the primary carer and have gone through some of those experiences. and. And just the way we've set up our world of work means that most men never do that. Um, and I think that's a loss for them as well as obviously something that has a big impact on, on women's um, career trajectories, on women, whether they retire with decent, superannu decent superannuation or whether they're going to end up in a situation where they're actually living quite precarious lives, you know, in retirement. Uh, yeah, you. Uh, I, I, I did note that you refer to your partner in your in your first speech, I should say, not your maiden speech, uh, as the unicorn. But you did so out of love and also out of a, a statistic that blew my mind, which I think is worth sharing. Yeah, so the, the um, percentage, and I, you know, I can't remember the exact percentage, but there is a really small three, thank you, that three uh, percent of only three percent of Australian families have a full time working mother and a part time working father, like. That is incredible. It is. Um, you know, and my partner still works um, part-time. He works four days a week so that, again, our daughter doesn't go to childcare every day and it just makes it easier, obviously, in terms of getting all those many things you, you need to get done when you have a child done. But we are absolutely in the minority um, there and I, I think that, you know, in this day and age there is no reason for that other than entrenched um, culture and, um, of course, the gender pay gap, mm. which, um, again, tends to mean that women are working in lower paid industries, which means when families are having that discussion about, well, honey, what does it look like when we go back to work? Um, it's much easier to say, well, really, you going back to work and, you know, some families are having the discussion around you going back to work doesn't make sense economically at all because of the cost of childcare. There, there are women, you know, I've, I've had those playground conversations with women um, where they said, yeah, we looked at them now that there's two, you know, we really just thought it's going to cost us more to send them to childcare than it is for me to go back to work. And again, I make the point that that means those women are going to end up with far less in their superannuation. Um, they are going to earn less for the rest of their career. Um, because they will have had this long break that if we had a system that I think culturally was different but also where our childcare was um, more affordable and accessible would be different. It's criminal that superannuation isn't paid on so many different um, components but the fact that it's not paid on parental leave is criminal. I just It boggles my mind. Yeah, look, I think... Um, you know, having worked for Jenny Macklin when actually that legislation was passed and we introduced it, it was such a big step to have that introduced. And I know it was such a long fight for so many women and so many people in the movement. Um, and I think there was the sense at the time that, um, you know, this was a huge step forward, but that is now 10 years ago. Mm. And the problem is we haven't had any steps forward since then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Look, we've uh, we've reached our hour. We could talk about this and many more things uh, um, forever, which means that I'm going to have to get you back on the show again and um, break down some of the the fine work that you're you're doing in Parliament um, and in your community as well. Uh, so, Kate, thank you very much for coming on the show today. Um, we wish you the Thanks, best. David. We wish you the best of luck, um, and hopefully, when those restrictions start to lift, um, that you can get back out there and uh, start pressing the flesh with some great people in your community. Absolutely, yes. I think we're all looking forward to that. Thanks for having me. No worries.